Hi everyone, welcome to 24 Hours of Chaos 2022 edition. Um, before we kick off, I just want to say a massive thank you to everyone who's involved. And this is incredible thing happening for the community and the industry. And I personally feel very honored to be around such amazing and inspiring people. Um, thank you, Kales, and thank you, Nigel, for organizing another year. It's been incredible before, so I'm sure there is another show that's going to be awesome. Um, and I want to say thank you to all the speakers tonight, and thank you guys for sharing your experience, your passion, and your knowledge with us and the audience. It means a lot to us. Um, to be honest, we had quite a big demand. I'm not going to be bra I'm not going to be bragging, but we had a big demand for people who wanted to present. But we kind of felt like we selected a very good and unique and passionate speakers to have tonight from different kind of industry, uh, same aspects, but the same industry, but different aspects. So thank you guys for being with us. And um, I would probably um, shut up for now and just in introduce myself. Um, I'm Ioana and I'm one of the hosts uh, of show one alongside with Nicholas and Pedro. Uh, I'm also a 3D artist and I work at Ing, um, a creative studio based in London. Um, and uh, yeah, that's enough from me. So thank you all again for being with us tonight. And it means a lot. And um, I'll head over to Pedro. Hello, everyone. I'm Pedro. I am the founder of In Between Us, an uh, online and offline experience company for the RPS industry. And uh, I really hope that you enjoy not only the show one, but the entire event. And uh, with that, I'm ending the, the ball to Nicholas. Thank you, Pedro. So, hi everyone. My name is Nicholas. I um, teach at 3D College Denmark, and I also have this small YouTube channel called Chaos Theory, where I do a lot of uh, tutorials, specifically around V-Ray and Chaos products in general. Uh, I also do a bit about 3ds Max and everything else. And yeah, I'm really excited to be here again. I was here with both Ioana and Pedro last year on Show One as well. Uh, and it's um, super exciting to uh, show you guys which all the speakers that we've uh, lined up for you. So um, without actually going too far into it, um, the first speaker we're about to hear about uh, or hear from is John, also known as another artist, which is very weird when you think about it because of the naming scheme that he's working with. It uh, makes it really confusing to talk to him sometimes because um, he always talks about hiring another artist and I'm, it confuses me every time. Um, but without going too much into that, I think that we're about uh, ready to uh, go and see John's uh, presentation. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is John Luke Hodgkins and I am just another artist. Uh, firstly, um, Sorry, uh, uh, firstly, I um, would like to thank Chaos Group. Sorry, I can cut all of this, what is going on? Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Chaos Group uh, for having me. Okay, that, I definitely, okay, I'm, I'm keeping this rolling, because that, I definitely saw something that time. And, oh, oh Jesus, uh, sorry, I don't know what is going on, oh my god. Um, Okay, this is insane. I, I don't know if you're seeing all this, but okay, I need to, uh, this is ridiculous. Oh my God. Um, oh, Jesus. Okay, I probably need to come back and do this at another time because I don't know what's going on. Okay, sorry. Hi everyone. Sorry about that first introduction. That went terribly wrong. Um, so my name is John Luke Hodgkins and I am the director of the Visual Arts Studio, another artist. Um, thank you, uh, Nicholas, for the invite today and it's a pleasure to be here at Chaos. Um, Today I'm going to show you how I did a breakdown of my introduction. So starting at the beginning, the way this project worked out was I started for an idea and then came up with a very quick and dirty um, storyboard. This was to give me an indication of timings and things I wanted to say and kind of actions where my head should move. It was very basic, but I did this whole project in two days, including the VFX breakdown. So. It was a bit of a rush, but um, yeah, I, I tried to smash it out. So I then got the camera equipment out and started filming on green screen and then did a clay um, render of the space and then eventually rendered it and commented it all together. So this is just a very quick breakdown of 
the layers that went into this project. And then I'm going to go into more detail as how each layer was kind of created. So starting off, I measured my office because when I do meetings, this is normally my background. So I wanted it to continue being my background within this presentation. So I went around, grabbed measurements of absolutely everything. Then I jumped straight into 3D and started modeling everything in just quite simple, basic formats using blocks as my measuring um, kind of facility. I did not have the CAD drawing, so I had to model it all, model it all from scratch. And obviously to do this as quick as possible, I just use some really basic techniques. I using photographs of the existing windows and then bring them in and remodeling them. I even tried doing some 3D scanning of some of the objects using some basic free um, apps I downloaded. The geometry was pretty chunky, so it um, wasn't great to use. So I used photography that I took of the individual product items and then joined with the photographs and the, and the 3D scan. I remodeled from scratch everything um, that was in my room. I only had one existing model, um, so everything else I had to model and texture from scratch. So here you can see me placing the items after they were modeled. So then moving on with lighting, I um, used uh, interactive light mix, which is a pretty awesome tool I use you know, quite religiously within Corona. I was trying to match to the existing site. Luckily, it was all around me because I was sitting in the space at the time. So this is just a little inception sort of um, view of me zooming into my desk. Obviously, in real life, I didn't turn on my LEDs. Uh, the next step was to make sure it was all camera tracked and matched properly. So looking at the heights of the cameras and the 3D cameras and then putting them into 3D space and matching it. Here's a render versus photograph. Um, the next step to do a teaser I put a little camera in there, walked around in real time and tried to match the exact camera movements. I didn't really have time to, to track this camera and then, you know, bring that data into uh, 3ds Max. So I did it as best as possible, adding a noise sort of um, modifier to the camera. Um, I did this originally and then rendered it, but I wasn't really happy with it because um, it wasn't as long as I hoped for it to be. I needed it slightly longer. Um, so the I so I redid it. Um, so I put a longer cut camera path in there, and then I used the new zoom tool on within my new iPhone, and I tried to replicate that again within 3D space. Um, it's a little bit janky, but I think it kind of kind of works. And then I did a VO, and then added some headers, and then the um, the teaser was was complete. Now I had my 3D space, I needed to do some rehearsals and acting for the full 50 seconds talk over the VO. So once I had set up my cameras and my green screen and you know got out all the equipment I needed, I then started filming. Um, I tried to do this in a short period as, as possible. I managed to get my footage I needed. Um, not great, but not an actor. Then the next step was to realize that I had to redo it because my hair was messy because it's normally messy. So in order to green screen more simpler, I decided to go back and gel my hair and then redo it um, and then start, you know, doing a basic rough roto of myself and then putting it back into 3D space and making sure that, you know, it's all, it's all lined up and the timings work with, you know, my head movements and, and objects moving around. The next step was to animate everything. So all the objects I'd modeled from existing real life, I then went back into 3D and just did very, very quick and dirty animation, uh, camera constraint, path constraints, noise modifiers, you know, clone modifiers, just really simple keyframe of all the objects. It's more like the cheerleader effect. When you look at the individual objects, they're not very good, but when you look at them all together, you they look a little bit better. So I was going for that because I was obviously concerned that I didn't have much time to do this full um, project. But as you can see, there's quite a few resolved, you know, sort of objects and some that aren't so resolved. For example, the ending where we get, you know, kind of eaten, the camera gets eaten by a fish. I used quite simple, you know, soft, um, soft selection on the polys. I used uh, FFD modifiers. And I use a path constraint, um, which, you know, some really simple modeling and um, animation techniques. Um, and I think 
as cheesy as it is, it kind of kind of works. Uh, so here is the final uh, play blast of the animation with everything kind of moving and uh, timed to kind of the way I set up. The next the next step would be to start making sure that I've uh, tracked the keyframes and they match the the sound. I try and uh, use my Beth charts and Chrome balls and gray balls to get the real world. Uh, lighting setups and, and information and camera distortion so then I can reintroduce that back into the new comp to make it look that little bit more realistic. So the first thing I, I do in comp is get the footage and then bounce out as a denoise version and I use the denoise version. I remove the, all the overspill and the, um, using despill. Uh, sometimes the, the image uh, has a lot of green in it so I try to remove all that and then breed it to what I think is appropriate. Then I go back from my um, bounced out keying and I use that as a mask so I use IBK to get my to remove the green and then I get my mask and then put it back in from there I you know I start playing around with the lighting and the overall light, um, fake lighting coming in and some dust um, particles this really helps to add that realism and that kind of contrast with all the passes I bring in I use a velocity pass so I don't render out the motion blur in 3ds max anymore I like to do it all in post so I've got more control over it. So I add velocity to every single pass. Um, then looking at the green of the footage compared to the background, I try to replicate that green by taking it from the original footage and integrating it and introducing it to the background to making it fit more, more closely. Then looking at the fish, there's a moment where he comes from behind me and he's rotated out and then he, he obviously comes and eats the screen so he has to go in front of me so by using a merge node i managed to, to replicate that sort of effect i also blew out one of my passes to to get my nice blooming glares um, and the blues bouncing off me and the pinks either side i managed to do that as a screen over the top and it ended up looking you know kind of quite nice i hope you've enjoyed this presentation and you've got something out of it if you'd like to ask me about anything i've done or if you'd like to collaborate or work together please email me hello at anotherartist.co. Um, my website is anotherartist.co or follow me on Instagram at anotherartist and artist has all the underscores. So thank you very much for watching and take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'll clap again. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> well done. Your room seems fine. Oh, yeah, I put it back, to, back together just now, so it's fine. Ah, that was quick. Well done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just for this uh, presentation, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, right, that was great, man. Um, yeah. Okay, I, I actually want to kick off with a quick question because sure. um, there was one thing I was wondering. And why did you decide to model the whole room instead of just doing like matte objects uh, on top of whatever was there in, in the shot? Um, so originally I didn't know where I wanted it to go and I was very conscious about time. So I was like, I always have this theory, once everything's in 3D, you have more control over it. So I was like, okay, great. I will do as much in 3D as possible. And then from there, work out where it's going to go. Um, yeah, I was thinking of other things I could have done in the background, but I thought this would be very good like demonstration of what I wanted to portray with the whole green screen and why I green screened it in the first place. Um, so yeah, good, good question. <laughs> Great. Um, so uh, a person from the audience asks, uh, what are some of your favorite ways to learn new stuff? Maybe resources from somewhere. Okay. Uh, so I use, obviously I'm always on Pinterest and uh, Instagram and stuff. So I always get like ideas and inspiration from them. Um, with learning new stuff specifically, I, I like to have an idea first. And once I've got an idea, I feel like that's the hardest part of any process in terms of design or creating anything. Because once you have that idea, then it's so much easier to try and create it or, or develop some sort of pipeline to get to that sort of end result. Um, I, I find it quite difficult just to sit in front of like my screen and just create something without that initial like inspiration or like idea or dream, whatever it is, um, to like to get to that end goal. I can never just like sit there and do weird stuff. I always feel like there needs to be like a sketch or something I create first in order that leads down that path. All right, cool. Um, 
I think Robin has a question for you. Yeah, I have one. Um, which which part do you enjoy the most, or do you just enjoy being the overlord of everything? Overlord. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, is it is, is it the compositing part? Is it the 3D part, or you know, or is to it just honest, the whole, just everything? I think it's more the creativity part of it. Like knowing so, like, that we have these storyboarding and stuff. Like knowing that we have these capabilities to create whatever we want. That's what kind of gets me excited. Um, in terms of the software, they they just they're super helpful to get us to that that point. Um, but I think for me, I just love actually just being able to create something really weird and wonderful. I don't know about wonderful, but weird. And, and knowing that it's, um, I don't know, it just makes me kind of enjoy my job and life a little bit more. Yeah. Cool. Are there any of the processes that you enjoy more than others? As in, do you, do you find yourself wanting to stay within like the compositing phase more or the uh, modeling phase or, or where do you like, where, where do you send when you create a project like this? Yeah, it's, it's quite funny. Cause it's always like the, do you do it in 3d or do you do it in post? And I, like, I, you know, I love, I love doing both. Um, I, I'd like when things kind of work, like say for, if you're doing something in 3d and then you can just kind of, it, it just works, whatever you're trying to do, then that's kind of more enjoyable. But once, you know, you're going to post. Post is always a little bit more difficult, I find. Um, but I like the challenge. So it's like a, I, f I feel like post production is a, a bit big of a like a learning like a learning curve. Um, so I guess the aspect once you do something in post, it feels great or whatever. I don't know. Um, but I, I do like originally I started off as a as a like a model, and I got uh, I think I got pretty far because I was doing really detailed modeling. Um, and I used to love 3D modeling assets and, and you know, end up getting pretty quick at doing that. So I would say back in the day, that was my favorite thing to do. But now I kind of just like being a generalist um, and also pretty much everything now you can buy off like off the shelf. So uh, there's not much point for, you know, to be a, a really good modeler, you know, especially when it comes to ArcBiz. Um, it gets a bit more complicated. I work a lot with artists, which always, they always have bespoke like ideas and sculptural designs and products and stuff they want to put out there. So then that always pushes me a little bit to work out, you know, what tools to use to create their ideas. Um, so that, yeah, that, so in terms of which, which sort of aspect, I just, I don't know, I, I like the whole pipeline of, you know, of, of the whole process. Yeah. So more of the uh, the generalist approach to everything and just, you know, can be able to deep dive into whatever. Um, that's kind of cool. So there's a question from Twitch actually is uh, what throughout the process was the most difficult to match your vision? And my question on top of that, did you even have a clear vision? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, to be honest, because I was trying to like do it in a very like time constraint, I think that was probably it. It's one of those things. If I spent a little bit more or a lot more time on it, it could have looked really well, pretty good. But because I tried to smash it out in a very short period of time, that was kind of my main downfall on this main project. Because like I was trying to do really simple techniques within the you know presentation anyway, just to you know because I needed to get through not just the 50 second. Uh, uh, animation, but I also need to get through the actual breakdown of it as well um, and not take up too much time. So yeah, I guess time constraint. And speaking of time constraint, um, did you have any issues regarding uh, rendering? How was the rendering process for you? Was it a long rendering process? Did you go with CPU versus GPU, etc.? So for this one, uh, the teaser, I rendered just on my local computer um, and that wasn't you know, it wasn't too time, um, time, like it ba basically when it came to the main animation, I outsourced it to a render farm. Um, I was like, I, you know, I just want this done within the next few hours so I can start the comping process. Um, but I try and keep my scenes like pretty optimized. So I know that the renders are either going to be quite cheap to, uh, render or quite quick. Um, so that, that comes down to, you know, how you actually get into the, the 3d and how you lay your layers, your, um, how you, how you structure your layers and how you proxy all your materials and your, your geometry, um, to make sure that you do get the, the fastest renders possible. Yeah. All right, cool. So 
You just showed us some crazy VFX. Uh, why did you choose such an unusual approach to your presentation? And is that something you do often or you uh, used to this occasion to escape from like your normal kind of work, line of work? <laughs> to, be honest, to be honest, this is my normal type of work. Uh, we do, uh, we do like um, like some some TV adverts and stuff, which will revolve around the same sort of pipeline. Um, so instead of presenting a previous project we've done, I thought it'd be quite nice to do a unique project specifically for for chaos. And then obviously by doing that, meant I can keep on top of um, the the actual background information and assets you know without without going even like diving into a previous project and, and trying to look for stuff at least by doing this process meant i can create it as i'm creating the breakdown which kind of helped me create the breakdown quicker and give me kind of more material to to edit all right cool that was my question but i'm glad you answered it <laughs> i can answer it again exactly <laughs> no it was great it was great i have another one actually which is so you say this is your normal work so what is actually your normal work what can you introduce this to you a little bit and like what's your you know what what is the creative challenges you have during the day with your clients what type of clients you get in and so on i'd like to know that so i originally started in architecture um but i tried for quite a few years to, to diversify out of architecture and take on as many different sort of projects and clients as possible. So every day kind of consists of either working with product designers or product um, you know, brands or music videos or TV adverts. And it's so varied because um, that's kind of what I love. I love knowing that we have this kind of really powerful software to create whatever we want essentially. Um, so by limiting who I work with, means I, I'd have to limit my projects. So by extending my, you know, vocabulary of, of uh, the type of work I create means I kind of attract different types of, you know, individuals. Um, and that for me is like the best place I want to be. So I, I, like on my website now, I have adverts, artists, architecture and product. Um, and it seems as though it's quite like, uh, it's quite down the down the middle with who who actually comes to me more in terms of like say architects or developers or artists um and i'm just like privileged that i get to work with many different like incredible talented people um and trying to like visualize their ideas and dreams um and and every day is different like from working with crazy uh brands like in the middle east to say working with like michael jordan on personal sculptures to working with huge architects it's it it massively varies literally week to week um sometimes i get people ask me like oh what are you doing today and it will just be the most random answer that sounds like i'm just high or something that's a great answer i really like it especially like the everyday is different part it's really good thank you for giving us a little bit of an insight I think, uh, Christian, you yeah, had a question. I was going to say, um, when you're explaining like the reason you did this video, that it's a really good idea in general just to um, do behind the scenes footage as you're working on something, because going back and grabbing it afterwards, way more difficult. Just yeah. screen grabbing. <laughs> That's amazing. Definitely. Yeah, that'd be a job within itself to, to you know, go and archive everything and work out what is usable. I putting together my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> you still have time. I think a lot of us have tried making content in as BTS or behind the scenes content right after a project has been done. And you realize that, oh wait, I actually need to redo the whole project almost <laughs> all over just to get the behind the scenes shot. Uh, that actually reminds me of uh, Thomas, who we had on the show last year. He had this amazing behind the scenes shot of a, a Viking documentary or something. You guys should all go check it out after 24 hours of this show um, <laughs> and see the, the behind the scenes he also did because that that's just so much extra work. It's it's yeah, it's mind boggling as well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, John. It was an awesome presentation so and yeah. an insight into your very weird mindset. <laughs> um, we love it. Welcome. We love it. <laughs> yeah, I think thank you so much. Petro. Thanks, guys. Yeah. <laughs> it's me. And How are you I, doing? 
I'm doing well and hope everyone that they are watching us on YouTube, Twitch and Facebook Live are uh, enjoying. But now we are going to have an Italian guy that lives and works in Spain <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and is the founder of the award-winning uh, artist studio, Aesthetica. Hello, Andrea. Hi, everybody. Hello. 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 So Hello. we... We will need to have a couple of time to have uh, everything sorted. But uh, if you have any questions for Andrea presentation, keep writing them. You are reading them on every single platform that you are watching us. So feel free to do it. Don't be scared. We will try to answer everyone. So thank you. So I don't know if we have the team ready behind to share. Yeah, it's on. Hello everybody, my name is Andrea Baresi and I'm the founder of Aesthetica Studio, a rendering company based in Barcelona. It is a great pleasure to be here uh, with you today to share my experience and have the possibility to uh, present our work to this big community. So a special thanks to Chaos uh, for organizing uh, this event and for taking us into consideration um, it is really, really, really a great honor for, uh, for me and for uh, my small studio to be part of this show. So maybe of you, some of you uh, have already heard of us. Um, we've been already almost five years in, the, in this industry. And, um, and this year we got the CG Award for the best commissioned image for this project by Snohetta, which is a, an architectural firm based in Oslo, in Norway which designed this fantastic platform uh, in a fjord, in the middle of a fjord in Norway. So the project was already beautiful and did half of, more than half of the job. But it was really fantastic to work on this uh, project. And, uh, and, uh, but what is interesting is that this image is the result of a, of a long, long and continuous process of research and mostly uh, some, a kind of a state of mind that we have here in Aesthetica and today I would like to show you some of the principles that led us to this image. So before, <laughs> before that, so how have we ended up there? Like uh, how did we get to that image? It's, I don't really want to do like a, a, a once upon a time presentation when I was a kid and making drawings but I just want to give you a, a little bit of background of where I'm coming from and uh, how do I think how do I consider architectural visualization? So I started to work as a 3D artist at Treixen in Copenhagen, in Denmark. Uh, I was an internal 3D artist and uh, I really had this struggle of uh, uh, delivering the work that I was asked to do on a day-to-day basis by the different architects team, so a lot of pressure. Uh, but at the same time, my struggle was to find always in every image is some kind of nice, interesting moments and then became uh, some special moments and then then became a research for, a, for an atmosphere, for an artistic feeling and, and some, some kind of atmospheric magic in every single shot. So little by little I started to look for that feeling in every image I was doing. Uh, maybe sometimes it was a detail, maybe sometimes it was uh, other uh, parts of the composition, maybe sometimes it was the whole image and uh, and yeah I was happy about it, I was really at some point, it, this, this is an image of 2015, 2016 I guess, so uh, I, I kind of liked the work I, I was doing but there was never really time for uh, that artistic research, uh, there was never time to look for alternatives uh, and uh, find different options and uh, investigate and exploring. So yeah, I was happy, but is this, was that my best image? Was that really all I could do? Maybe, maybe, maybe it was, maybe, maybe, maybe not, <laughs> maybe not. So I need more. That's when I realized that I really need more uh, to express uh, uh, myself. So. That's when I decided to move to Barcelona and to found, found uh, Aesthetica Studio. This is a very <laughs> back in 2017, uh, when I only had the laptop and, and uh, a lot of ideas in my mind. 
and then uh, luckily uh, things evolved uh, and then now we are a group of four people actually five uh, one we don't have the picture yet um, and, we, and we work with all the seven most important architectural firms in Europe <coughs> which uh, they're not like super big companies but some the companies we work with uh, understand our process and uh, our research and our struggle so in every work we try to follow our principles and uh, these principles are these two like photo artistic and iconic that's how an image should be for us what do we mean by photo artistic uh, when we say I, invent, I kind of invented this word and uh, I think it's uh, we have this goal to represent the architecture to a super realistic uh, and detailed uh, uh, setting, like a real world uh, setting, like super realistic textures, uh, super realistic photography and uh, scans and uh, everything that makes the image look convincing. But at the same time, this image has to be like pervaded by magical and outstanding, like unreal elements. So like grasping the attention of the viewer by with the through the, the realistic uh, elements, and then uh, once you have the attention, then uh, bring them to this magical world. And uh, <clears throat> that's what what is kind of visible here that we have this a lot of pictures to simulate this forest, uh, pictures, 3D models, scans, and everything. But then so it is real, but it's not really like. Uh, it is not really a realistic image in the end of the day, I would say. But it has something of real and unreal component, which we really like. And also, in, uh, in, uh, for example, here, yes, there are some human and recognizable elements, but in the end, the atmosphere, there is something that is kind of... Uh, this atmosphere that makes it feel like uh, it doesn't really exist. So, yeah, this is another... Uh, uh, another shot with this, this intent of putting like realistic elements and unrealistic atmospheres. And on the other side, we always try to go for iconic shots. So there are some shots that are immediately recognizable by the viewer. So we usually do these tiny drafts uh, to check if this uh, image is working in terms of lighting, composition, and colors. Uh, or when an image is iconic, when it's super recognizable, when it represents an idea, like in this case, it was like the it was the uh, a museum in the forest. Uh, so there was this forest of columns, and this was the, really the concept of the of this project. So the iconic image had to represent this project without showing everything. It just had to show the important thing. Anyway, it was this project actually, yeah. And uh, yeah. Iconic when it evokes a feeling, of course. So every time we try to evoke some feeling, uh, like in uh, this, uh, this is the platform project by Snow Hat, uh, and uh, we were following this feeling of this uh, late, uh, late, late summer, end of the day, low sun, uh, a bit melancholic, uh, when everything is about to end, the day is about to end. Some is about to end, so we always like to uh, get away with the images that we work on. And then, of course, the story. Why don't you tell me a story? We're always asked to tell a story from the clients, so but we our research is more like into translating this story into something a bit more subtle and to suggest uh, unexpected situations. Like if you have an atrium view of a school. Uh, uh, then maybe it's a big mess uh, and it can be like in this case with the paper flying uh, like uh, paper planes flying uh, um, it was really a, an, a, a fun, fun view to work on and I remember the jury here eventually they won the competition uh, reminded this image as the paper planes once so it's also important to get the right story and make it recognizable in this case, the story was the match of uh, super uh, difficult. This, was, this image was extremely difficult because we really wanted to tell a story of the new stadium, 
from the mm, from the level of the of the field. But it, so we had to find the right story, the right picture of the right team with the right lightning. So it was a lot of struggle in finding the high resolution picture with the perfect lighting. But that was the result, and it's quite quite powerful. And also in this case, the story was important because it was the story of a representation like a in, a, in a theater. It was a project in Norway, always by Snohetta, this black box theater. Uh, and the jury uh, was also the theater company, so we placed in the middle of the image uh, uh, a performance of the theater company that was in the jury. <laughs> so it was kind of blinking the eye and say, say, okay, guys. We know you. So, yes, the story is super important. But what I wanted to say with this presentation is that we never settle. And that's what I think is the most important thing for this job. Like, you always have to consider that the, your next image is the best one. And never, never, never look back and be happy with what you've done. Yes, you can be happy, but you also need some push to continue walking forward. So how do we get to the best image if the best image is the next one? Well, with sketches probably. We do so many, so many sketches and I would like to share with you a few examples today just to, uh, to kind of communicate our struggle every time we start a project. <laughs> so you remember this image from before and uh, the chair is falling apart. Um, yeah, this image was the, the, museum, the museum in the forest. So, before, how did we get there? Well, this was the first draft, uh, kind of flat. We didn't really understand what was going on and nothing was happening. Uh, and, but there was probably some kind of uh, something interesting. Then started to go around and see, okay, but this is a forest of column, but maybe, maybe, maybe from inside could be nice. Uh, they didn't have, a, and usually architects when they come to us don't have any idea of what they want. So we really go, have to go around and propose alternatives. Uh, like this one is where we started to say, okay, but this 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 transition with columns can be a good starting point, but it was a bit flat. So maybe maybe with some fog, or maybe with some more atmosphere. Maybe it could work, but we got kind of got that this forest of columns had to be portrayed uh, like in this way. So we said, ah, okay, maybe the light in the forest usually filters through the trees, so this this could be really a, a good one. But uh, maybe it's a, it's maybe it has to be a brighter, <coughs> so with more light coming in, and then finally we got there. So yeah, it's from here, then little by little you can see that this struggle continues until. Like we sketch, we sketch, we sketch until we find the, the right one, which eventually turns to to the final uh, <coughs> to the final image. And uh, yeah, I also wanted to share with you just for a second the draft that we did for this project, just to show you our research. We had to do just the two images, and eventually that turned out with five or six. Uh, so we always do this study preparing all the 3D file for the drafts, uh, explaining every draft uh, that we do, why we do it, because there is really like uh, an artistic, uh, 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 artistic uh, struggle and research behind uh, every single shot. So it takes a lot of time and a lot of efforts. We end up super tired every time. But in uh, uh, every every image uh, <coughs> there is always like there is always an, a, an intention of showing uh, the project in a completely different way this was the draft of course of the of the image of the cg award uh, and uh, trying to cap capture different atmospheres every time with, with photos with 3d there is no no distinction so yes this is uh, more focusing on the building uh, going around, uh, some, some close-up, uh, going far away with uh, different alternatives of lightning, uh, atmospheres, uh, then that leads to different stories as well. So, 
uh, yes, I don't know how many, there are so many, <laughs> this was the Fjord one, this was the one that eventually became that one, then this one was kind of the guy running the getaway in between uh, this uh, curved wall, uh, then another round of drafts, uh, so as you can see we really, uh, we're never happy with what we do, so, and this forces us to continue and to continue and to find different uh, options and angles and we, until we find uh, the one that we really like. So yes, this was like the result uh, of, and this was the final result of that uh, image. As you can see, it's not like a perfect image <laughs> at all uh, because the, these guys are flying. Nobody realized in the in the CG architect uh, jury, or maybe they did. I don't know. And uh, yeah, so it is this big, big mistake, but we like mistakes. So yes. Anyway, as I said, your next image is the best one. Maybe next time we don't do that mistake again. Thank you very much for your time and uh, for being here today with me. So I hope to hear from you soon. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> Amazing work, Andrea. It's uh, really well awesome. Thank you. See, as an archivist guy, so I really keep mind blowing every time that I see one of your, your work posted online. Uh, today was uh, not an exception. But uh, yeah, we have already people on chat going crazy. We have a few questions coming up, but uh, I really also would like not to talk only about the the project behind, but because Chaos and also myself and the team between us uh, brand, we are always looking for the next uh, talent, right? For the next generation, and uh, Chaos are, are also super active in the in the field of the the students and the education. And I really would like to see if you have any word that you can share for those that are starting their careers, right? Because you move from Italy. Copenhagen to Copenhagen to Barcelona. So you really did a lot before you you found and started your own studio. It's possible to give something for those that are really starting or want to shift a career like you did previously. Yeah, well, uh, quite a uh, nice nice question. But <clears throat> I think uh, what I would try to um, what I su would suggest to the, to the people, to the new artists coming in and the, exploring the industry is mainly try to understand who you are and who who you who you want to be i mean although this industry uh, might seem quite standardized i'm talking about the arc of this industry um so and might look similar from outside but if you get a, a, a if you give a closer look uh, you can see that there is like a wide variety of fields uh, and uh, and um, and all the rendering studio, the archivist rendering studio are all different. Like, for example, in uh, in uh, in Barcelona, there we have a super nice community with many many rendering archivist uh, uh, rendering studios. And uh, but what is nice is that that everybody does his own uh, thing. Like uh, there is there are some some people uh, that run their own studio doing real estate, some other Unreal Engine uh, VR, some other interior architecture, some other commission the project we do uh international competition with mainly scandinavian offices so some other doing product design or more commercial projects so there are always like niches where you can mm, kind of focus uh, your uh, your work your effort so this is i think this is key to when you start uh, your own path to understand like like who you are and like where you want to focus uh, uh your your work and basically set a goal set a goal and uh, and uh, to set kind of a, a plan in uh, with this presentation i wanted to share a bit my experience uh, in turn like uh, because i before doing this i was working as a internal uh, render guy like pizza guy <laughs> in, a, in, another, in a big architecture firm in copenhagen as an in-house render guy so uh, that's also a way to do this this work so you work in a uh, close to close to the architects uh, there are so many positive uh, aspects of this job uh, because you work with a talented architect right sitting right next to you you get to know them you learn a lot of stuff uh, you, you you really like 
develop a powerful speed to solve problems as fast as possible. So you develop like so you develop like problem solving skills uh, alone, uh, and uh, you do get to do some uh, networking with the architect. So that's uh, definitely a, a recommendation to go uh, along that path if you're interested in architecture. Of course, there are also negative sides, but maybe I don't want to talk about negative sides in my previous jobs. So, but uh, yeah, of, as always, there are there are uh, positive things and negative things. So, the, but I think the the main thing is just to understand who are you and who who you want to be. Set your goal, set your your path, and then follow it. And then it might might be too 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 difficult to reach, too hard, too long. But the important thing is just to keep walking and following in so at least you move forward you know so that's uh that's why i said that your best image is kind of the, the next one yeah perfect thank you for sharing uh, the, the i found this really motivational thank you i need it yeah <laughs> super motivational <laughs> yeah no, and, uh, well, it's, uh... and uh, we have uh, other questions coming up we have someone from here on the screen that would like to to share and i will read someone from youtube so you can go forward Luis. yeah i can ask you a quick very quick question so andrea when was the exact moment that you realized or what was the series of steps that made you realize you had a much deeper understanding of your craft beyond just making cool a cool image or just cool images because i hear this so much in uh artists that are starting out in the industry and obviously you need to get to a certain point to be who you are and what you've done and what you've sort of accomplished a much deeper understanding beyond the superficial level well that's uh, uh that it was basically the, the the real struggle in the beginning because i didn't understand what i was doing i was not aware of that there was a rule that was i think mm, i think that all my images look different but from 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 outside they will they were clear that were done by me in the beginning and this is something that that i realized when i started to grow a team like when the when the new people came in to join aesthetica when i was alone um, and i had to uh, kind of abstract what i was i what i was doing to explain it to them that was the moment that i kind of realized okay but there is i always do the same thing and and it's uh, and that's why it comes out like that so the the more people joining the firm, the more people trying uh, trying to uh, to build a, a common uh, sense of um, aesthetic sense, uh, um, the more clear was that sense to me. And maybe when I was alone, I, I didn't really realize that. But then when other people want to do uh, like uh, wanted to learn first and then develop further after afterwards this uh, style of images but then i realized okay but then there is something there well, that's all. yeah sorry go ahead no no <laughs> keep, uh, keep did i did i uh, is this a uh, did i ever reply to the question yeah i think so I th it's it's interesting that, that that moment in time for you was uh when you were when you had to pass on information to a next generation so you 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 start as a professional you develop you get some skills, you achieve something. And then at some point in time, something is born inside you. And then when you realize you need to level yourself up in terms of communication and how you actually communicate with other people and transpose or, or I guess, um, transmit that sort of information, that's when you start to have a, a deeper understanding of what your craft is, because you, you have to, you're forced to strategize a little bit more. So it's, it's, it's amazing to, to hear that that's uh, that's uh, exactly that and uh, it happened after a couple of years like the first year i was alone so that i was not uh, uh, i was not aware of, of uh, that this existed <laughs> but then after two years when i had to hire somebody to to help me out and to grow and to continue the path um that that's the moment when it came like kind of more uh, more clear yeah, perfect. Oh, so we have uh, another two questions, but I believe we can make it together and ask as one. Um, well, how how do you get on? How you get clients uh, on board with the, the render that is more artistic 
uh, like you mentioned on your presentation, photo artistic, right? And instead of uh, informative of the architecture and uh, any advice how to use all the colors that you really use in your imagery that uh, are really outstanding and pop up to the eye to the public? Uh, well, regarding the clients, uh, I think it's more about cho uh, mm, mm, as, as it has been said before, it's, it's also choosing who you work with. Uh, so there is a, a bit of a, a filter. Of course, we get also annoying clients, uh, and it's part of the, sometimes it's sometimes sometimes well sometimes it's also a job. So it's work. So we all get uh, boring clients, boring images, and uh, requests. Uh, do this, do that, do this. Uh, but uh, we try to avoid that with the time. And we know the. We try to uh, like the clients that come to us know already that we get we have uh, this process, uh, and um, with this process we try to kind of surprise them first with the quantity, as it, as, as it was in the presentation with three thousand drafts, but also like. Uh, we always tend to prefer to work with clients that don't tell us what to do. Like there's no Heta project, the one of the CG award. They, I remember they came uh, with two images. They wanted two images. They don't know. Uh, there's no Heta never knows which images do they want. So they're like, uh, okay, this is a project. We need two images, just surprise. So, and that's the best way to, to work. And we try to work as much as possible with clients like that, because you cannot convince uh a rock that to be uh a tree <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it's, so it's, uh... <laughs> yeah completely agree and the the another question and i really think this is something that you mentioned previously that is uh, barcelona where you are based in the studio there is a lot of uh, amazing uh, studios out there right not only for our central competition but also for the marketing know. real estate everyone is there and uh, one of the questions is how important that you really think the location is uh, something important during these days right because we have people working remotely, studios working uh, from home. So how do you really think being based in Barcelona is a plus for your studio? Well, I think Barcelona, it, it helps uh, to attract people to come uh, to come and join the office. Uh, I mean, everybody knows the city uh, and it's uh, quite uh, quite cool. Uh, still met, still a, sm a small big city in Europe uh, next to the beach, next to the mountain. So, it has quite some appeal for the people who want to join. And that is was basically the main struggle in the beginning. Like nobody really wanted to join because nobody knew who I was, what I was doing. So the city can has helped a lot in that very first early stage. So it is it is uh, super important, even though we don't work like uh, for now, we don't work with remote uh, remote artists. We just try to keep it in house just to enjoy also the process together and the city. Perfect. Thank you. And I believe it's time to move forward. We have a schedule to 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 get ready. And uh, I believe it's Joanna now that I'm giving the word to you. I'm gonna present. No. Yeah. Don't worry, guys. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andrea, for the great presentation and for all the insights as well. It was really nice, really motivational. Yeah. I I have a yeah i felt really good about your presentation it feels really yeah all the things you said but thank you so i will gonna i'm gonna present the next speaker because i had the um personal honor to know christian and we have worked in the same environment and i'm not biased but he's one of the most talented artists i know um and uh yes i just wanted to say thanks christian for being with us tonight um and also as i promised in the beginning we're giving the audience a little bit of a different aspects from the same industry and we have something quite different now to see so yeah let's go to christian's presentation and i'm a cg artist working in the automotive field I've got around 13 years experience working for different post-production companies at different capacities. A couple of years back, I presented my back catalogue to 3D London and have been invited back by Ioana to give a, another presentation. But this time I wanted to focus a little more on the theory of what's important to us when image making. In 2018, my partner Rika and I started Wooden Gun as a boutique post-production studio offering a bespoke service. 
She's a photographer turned retoucher and I'm a CG artist who has spent most of his career being directed by photographers. Photographic principles and uh, basis in reality are integral to everything we do. I'd like to show you some examples of uh, images where we've pushed really hard to retain this physical integrity uh, in our work. Sometimes we push a little too hard, but you'll see. Working closely with photographers and other creators is really important to us. The early shared development of a project is always exciting. Bouncing ideas, references and building a treatment is one of the most rewarding parts of a project. The energy you build during these sessions can hold you over during the classically laboured end to a project prior to release. With each project we have done with Tilo Sikaneda, we have pushed things technically and visually further. Starting fairly straightforward with the Volvo XC40, we got to know each other and how to operate together. When he said he was shooting in LA and planning on capturing backplates and domes on lower ground, we saw it as an opportunity not to be missed. The location has been used so many times before, so we really needed to stand out. So we chose a bright yellow Lamborghini to stand out. In my personal work, I've been playing with mimicking tracking shots, where the camera follows the movement of the subject but stays in the same position, as opposed to being on a dolly or rigged to the car. For me, this gives a more voyeuristic look to the shot and makes the viewer feel like they're firmly at the location. This is easier to do in a full CGI environment, as everything has the correct scale and distance, so parallax is accurately. When using a single frame, some cheating needs to be done. In this case, cameras were matched and rough geometry modelled to project the backplate onto. An animated camera then renders the scene with motion blur. This also raised some issues for Rika in post as the photographic backplate needed to be retouched and extended to allow for the blur then projected, rendered with motion blur, have the car composited, integrated, and the whole image graded. This is a lot of work to make an image look as if it was taken by someone who by chance was there when the car drove past. I think it's this sort of detail that really makes the difference and the question of is it CGI becomes redundant. Continuing with Tilo, he really wanted to do a project with the McLaren 720S. This is a car we'd already used, uh, so the treatment had to be different. Being slightly obsessive about perspective, I noticed that within the bank of images Tilo had shot at night on a German bridge, many of the roads lined up perpendicularly to one another. From this, the double exposure treatment was born. The car needed to move and the background motion blur was going to be problematic with the number of layers of verticals overlaying a distant city light. There are a few options available. You can, and most would, um, blur the whole thing in virtual rig or path blur. You can get a better effect, masking a few layers and blurring at different speeds to fake the parallax, but we went one step further. Using the same principle adopted in the Lamborghini shots, I built the bridges roughly, all the layers of the bridge were masked, and the background city cleaned and extended. With all the images projected onto the geometry, I could animate the camera and render a new backplate with motion blur. All of the elements of the bridge structure move at the correct speed in relation to the camera. Can you see it? Do we take it too far? Does it matter? It mattered enough for us to do it, so maybe that's all that matters. Tilo also went above and beyond by shooting fire from a gas torch uh, for the exhaust and the close-up rear shot. It's light and mainly transparent, but like with the motion blur, 100% worth it to us. By now you can see the lengths we go to in order to create physically plausible still images. There's a number of ways V-Ray has helped us with this. When working on another portfolio project with Jack Schroeder, we were doing a similar setup. The location had no vehicle access, so it was an ideal scenario where CGI can be utilised. Jack shot HDRIs and also some very helpful short videos where he went around measuring things like floor tiles, steps and railings. When it came to rebuilding the shots in Maya to render accurate reflections, I could do it all to scale. I also had a camera metadata, so I could look up the aperture shape and a number of other characteristics. When it came to a shot with the car obscured in the foreground, 
I could render with a plausibly accurate depth of field. Using ray tracing in this way, the reflection of the model retains more clarity than the window geometry itself, something that happens in reality, but it's very difficult to achieve with a post-production depth blur. Other types of blur and distortion can play a big part in the feel of an image. Unless you're in a vacuum, the atmosphere bends light like glass and water based on the index of refraction. This IOR changes fluidly depending on things like humidity, what gaseous components are present, and temperature. This is how the mirage phenomena comes about via heat distortion. One thing that generates a lot of heat is an internal combustion engine. When researching for the racing collaboration, I conceived with Dimitri from Monolake Studios. This heat distortion played a big part. It's another visual cue that leads the viewer to engage in a synesthetic experience. To be able to smell the fumes, hear the engine, and feel the heat given off, all through seeing a picture. By layering refractive planes, I was able to match the distortion in my references. This image contains tracked motion blur, depth of field, heat distortion, environment volume, bloom and glare, and is graded to match a specific film. Of course, all this process creates a particular look that is not relevant to the majority of product shots. The motivation to keep things accurate does remain with cameras, framing and lighting. Even when moving around huge yellow light panels, like in the images we made for the launch of the Lotus Electra. These are not new tools, but there are a few I'd like to mention that I'm excited about as they can make my life easier in the future. Being around as long as I have, you get to see and experience a lot of different tools. VRED or VRED, usually used on power walls or VR to display design changes during the development of a vehicle, is a program I've used on live projects to create high resolution print imagery. It had a great environment dome with a lot more functionality than that of Mental Ray's RBL or V-Ray's Dome Light, as it could be moved and keyframed. It's a step between the infinite point and my projecting onto geometry method, making it very versatile. I'm happy to hear a similar HDR Dome Light has been released in the latest version of V-Ray. Another interesting new development is having a procedural cloud model. I tested view and ozone some years ago with mixed but slow results, but uh, the potential of being able to build skies is very powerful. In testing, it's very much in its infancy, but it has the potential of reducing our reliance on HDRIs in many cases. Over the last few versions of V-Ray, the frame buffer has become a more usable grading tool. With live interaction sessions, we can push the look of an image at a very early stage and get a solid idea of direction and buy-in from clients without touching Photoshop. On top of these, there are new technical tools to help with full CGI productions. Chaos Scatter, V-Ray, Enmesh, everything coming into Phoenix, there's a huge amount to look forward to. Looking at the work we've done, there's been a lot of progress, both technically and creatively, adapting tools towards our goals of creating not just convincing, but creatively inspiring CGI imagery. There's countless areas still to explore, and hopefully another time I'll be able to show you what we have in mind. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing all this with us. It's quite amazing. I mean, I've witnessed your magic, but it's still, it's still amazing every time I see your work. Um, I've got a question. Um, why cars? I mean, obviously, you're a very complete CGI artist and you're focusing on automotive. Why? I don't know. I've always um, been interested, not so much. I mean, I, I said this at the, the last presentation I gave that I'm not that interested in like car performance or any of like technical numbers of them, but I've been kind of obsessed with car design since like this big. So it matters to me more how they look and how they make you feel in their presence than actually how fast they are. That matters less to me. But it's always been something that's kind of in my mind. So to find a route there, which I found, yeah, it, my uh, first job in automotive kind of almost came by accident. Um, and then I stuck with it because it was fun. 
I see. Yeah, well, you just found your passion, I guess. <laughs> it just fitted in with my passion. I think it was, that's the, yeah. the luck of it. You can find um, something you like doing on a daily basis and get paid for it. That's a, a yeah, win-win. I agree. Um, well, I've got many questions for you, but um, does anyone have questions for Christian? Because I see all the guys are very excited about the presentation. Well, it kind of leads into the question I kind of prepared for Christian because you already kind of answered it. But so how did you get into the automotive visualization business? Did you, So I figured you aimed specifically to get into it. Um, if I understood your, uh, your answer correctly before, but how, how would anyone go to get into that business since it's a pretty niche field of work? Um, I'm not sure actually how niche it is. There's a number of, um, quite big studios who um, perform this work on a regular basis. I was just lucky enough that at the time when I found myself unemployed, um, after working for some other companies for a bit. And this was around the, um, the downturn in 2008 where master plans were kind of going to hell. Um, we, uh, I called one of my friends who I went to university with and he was just in the middle of starting up a, a company with another photographer and joining up with another company who mainly did car stuff. Um, so I just slotted in and everything went really, really well. And I was there for almost a decade. Cool. There is a question. No, first of all, there is a comment that I actually noticed as well, and it's really interesting. Christian does beautiful work. Even his bookshelf is organized by color for a very nice aesthetic. Nice. You seem no, this, very is, uh, this is not from me. This is from Rika, who's the post-production part of Wooden Gun. I see. It was um, absolutely color obsessive. <laughs> yeah, we can see that, but it's very nice. Um, is there any car you'd like to render that you haven't worked on? Or haven't done yet um i'm not particularly sure i don't really have any uh, like unicorns i'm chasing but um i really like doing vintage stuff and you, you'll see in a lot of my personal work or that that seems to be the way i go and it's usually like these kind of 1980s heroes boxy things that just uh have a nostalgic feeling for me um of the new stuff i'm lucky enough to be doing quite a lot of work as you saw in the um, video for lotus um but there's a few other kind of startups and concepts that we've been working with um some of which i hope to show you in the near future but currently not allowed to <laughs> <You're honest>. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> that actually leads me into a little bit of a thing here so if you if you're really into like vintage cars or more into vintage cars in general than maybe the more modern stuff. Um, mm. But since the world seems to go in a more vintage or retro kind of design aspect, how do you feel about that? Is it, do you feel like in general that they're nailing it or is it too much or, or how do you feel about all those aesthetics right now? It depends. Cause um, I mean, to keep, there, there was a period where everything just starts looking the same if they're going for future, 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 and everyone's just being, uh, this is what future means. This particular like negative scallop and the side of cars and that sort of thing um, seems to have come around and gone again. And people are now looking into like their back catalogs of designs. You've seen it with like the Renault 5 remake and what they're doing with um, the, you know, Fiat 500 makes and all, all this stuff. It's going to reoccur because they've already decided that that's their identity. And if that kind of sparks a some passion from their buyers, then they'll roll with it, I assume. But um, I just make the pictures. I don't design the cars. <laughs> I'm, I'm an outsider in that area. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. Um, we have another question from the audience. What does Christian want to learn next? <laughs> I'm sorry, I read it like that, but what do you want to <laughs> do next? <laughs> um, as far as uh, I've been recently doing some UE4 stuff, um, which is now going to be UE5, uh, which is a great tool, but outside of my usual remit, it can't quite do the things that I need it to do as far as if you see the photorealism side of things, but it's getting really close. Um, and on the side of that, there's a whole world of, stuff i really need to get into nuke um and i keep putting it off and putting it off but 
I don't right. quite have the capacity. That and um, Houdini would be um, are on the checklist of things, but you need to really deep dive into these things to get the knowledge to stick at this point. Yeah, I agree with you. Quite useful. Um, well, I have another question of myself, but if you guys want to jump in, I have a source of questions in my head. Where do you, how do you find your creativity? Where is it coming from? How do you inspire yourself and all those ideas and all those stuff? Is it like films? Because mo most of your stuff, for me, they look very cinematic. And mm -hmm. is it coming from that or is, where is it coming from inspiration wise? I think the cinematic side of things is basically trying to keep things in uh, an area that m makes you feel like you have been the one to take that picture, that it forces you to be in that place following that object with a certain lust for that thing, or, um, yeah, it goes back to the synesthesia side of things. Um, but I find, um, I've given this spiel before as well, uh, about creativity being um, that as a creative, you're not forming something from zero. It doesn't just come out of thin air. It comes from a, a back catalogue of what all your experiences throughout your life, be it touch, smell, see, dream. Um, and the creative part of it is bolting those different things into a certain, um, be it a visual, be it a song, be it, I, I, I just kind of believe that your personal experiences just become those things, whether it is from you just absorbing content from YouTube or whether it is uh you being outside next to a river and imagining swimming or something but it, it can be kind of that's theoretical um and then yeah the creative side of it is basically being able to cherry pick the useful things of that and then respond to a brief using those things yeah and that's kind of my thought and this does yeah. kind of lead, lead into ai as well but I will, we can leave <laughs> that for <laughs> yeah um so what do you look for when studying references and backblades in order to match realistic lighting and imperfections? Um, realistic lighting is kind of, um, uh, I, it's quite, I wouldn't say easy, but um, if you're using HDRs and backblades, generally they're shot in the same place. You just got to make sure they're color graded to the same thing. So if you've got, because uh, you're, if you're shooting, a photo you are then treating that and white balancing it to whatever it is that you decide to be so your sky is a certain blue your uh, sunlight feels warm or cool depending on how you've treated that in your post-production but in order to get something to sit in it your hdr has to look the same so the hdr has been shot 360 image also has to have the same color blue sky so that when you see it reflected or lighting the car it's got to represent that same blue as the sky and that's an instant like this doesn't look right because it's the wrong color so that can comes up quite quickly and then it's just getting shadow density to match your reference within that image and the, there's all these sorts of things that you've got to kind of keep in mind um it took me so so long to be able to analyze an image and pick out what was actually truly wrong with it you can tell something's wrong but then being able to go this is why it's wrong is far yeah. more difficult than um being able to tell someone that they're wrong and You'll kind of get this from, uh, well, I get it from client feedback quite a lot, is that oh, it just doesn't look right. I don't know why it just doesn't look right. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. usually these kind of little nuanced things that are not like self-explanatory. Uh, but there are certain aspects of this that do happen in nature and do happen in normal photography. You do get sometimes uh, a big bounce of a different color light flying into whatever it is you're trying to shoot. Um, and it doesn't make sense within that frame until you like move over there. And you're like, ah, oh, so that big yellow wall is casting that. Um, so there's just this, these sort of things, but if you're not telling that story that that yellow wall is there, you've got to make sure that it's explained within that image, otherwise it feels wrong. And then there's just lots of things like this. Yeah, I agree with everything you said, <laughs> especially for the pointing the, no, but I guess that's experience, you know, when you can't really point what's wrong with the image, but with experience and learning kind of from what you've done through the years, you kind of guess, you, you know, you, you kind of know your work and you know what, you know, what's wrong with it at some point. It's never perfect. It, oh, there's yeah. still stuff that I'm ripping apart all the time. It's like, I wish I had more time to do that, or I wish I had time away from that and gone back to it and then looked at it again. And then, oh, now I can see that this is wrong with it. Um, whereas I thought it was perfect, but it's not. 
yeah but there's always this kind of rest time in between projects as well so you go back and think oh i could have done that better i could have done that better or i wish yeah. i'd spotted that before it went public <laughs> well that's what um andrea's presentation was as well like you're exactly. like yeah um does anyone have, have a, any questions i have a quick question yeah so when you're out and I didn't really catch did you when you're doing the backplates and HDR and stuff like that so you you were out with the client or on your own prepping for a shot with a, an actual camera right mm -hmm. occasionally yes okay okay um, yeah, but sure. you, so, you, but how you do you work in collaboration but yeah cool yeah but how would you uh how do you capture your HDRs do you use yeah. specific products specifically for HDR capturing um, I've got like a, um, so many yeah. different options. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, the easiest ones are like um, John was using the is it the Ricoh 360 camera, and um, but to get because we're working with like super highly reflective objects, we need a lot of resolution to make sure that all the um, stretch reflections come out nice and cleanly. Um, I'm using a, a nodal head, which is essentially sticks on the top of the tripod and holds the camera pointing in one direction, and pivots around the center of the lens. And then you turn it into multiple angles and take bracketed photos, however many stops up, however many stops down, and then the whole thing stitched into a 360. So this is a fairly um, economic setup. You, you need a DSLR and um, you pay the money for the nodal head if you've already got a tripod. It's quite neat. Um, and I'm using a, a specific fisheye lens. Um, but you this has been like automated to within an inch of its life um, by Lizard Q, who have that, but it's then on a robot head and it spins the DSLR around and you do it from your phone and then it just the image it for you and then sends it back. But that's like 20 grand if you yeah. want to buy one of those. But you can rent them for a shoot because it's so much more straightforward and takes far less of your worry time sitting there shaking while they've got a road closed. <laughs> trying to get this thing done <laughs> yeah and i guess time is also one of the factors right because the weather obviously changes if you take too much time using like a dslr setup compared to yeah. like one of the 360 solutions from like a cheap one would be maybe a tether uh their c1 camera or whatever it's yeah, called it's, yeah. uh which does a fairly good job but obviously for high reflective high yeah, yeah, yeah. high imaging and so on yeah yeah. yeah, I mean, it, yeah, the weather's changing constantly. Um, and then these, these are just the general challenges of doing the stuff that if you want a good representation of what you're doing, it's good to shoot a standing car and then move the standing car out of the way and then shoot the back plate and then shoot your HDR. But the time between you having the car in there and shooting your HDR, the sun's moved however many degrees and the, the whole scene changes. So it's, yeah, got to be pretty quick about it. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Well, thank you, Christian. If anyone has any questions, put them in the chat so we might be able to answer them at the end. Um, but yeah, thanks, Christian, again for being with us. Um, and, you're right. you're um, and I think we should move on to our last presentation of those guys from Narrative that you can see on screen. We have we have two of them. Um, here with us tonight and I'm gonna again do a quick intro because you're obviously presenting yourself but um, for me narrative is quite a unique studio and not because just because for all the things they do they have a very diverse work and they have a very versatile skill set so um, I'm a massive fan and again I'm not being biased but one of my favorite studios in London and um, thank you guys for being with us tonight and sharing your, again, your passion for everything you do and your exceptional work. And from people would see, but it's quite different. And I'm really, really, really happy to have you on board. So yeah, let's see what you have prepared for us. Well, thank you. My name is Luis Desiarte and I am the founder and co-director of Narrative. We are a boutique visual communication studio based in London.
I'd like to introduce our talk this year. We've called it Entering the Unknown. Because I have no idea what to say now. And that is phenomenal. For fuck's sake, how many takes have I done? I did it excellent the first time and right now. weirdest, most out of the box, most unexpected project that we can showcase here and that we've worked on, uh, I guess in the last probably decade, is the collaboration that we've had with Griffin. And uh, Griffin is an electronic music artist who's becoming an incredibly big deal in the US and internationally as well, um, with all the music that he's creating and all the collaborations and everything. And he's a guy who, who, who he doesn't personally say, but he composes everything and collaborates with some of the best talent out there. So keep an eye on this guy. He's, he's going to wreck some, some souls. I never really thought it in any part of my career, I would be um, creating the animated visuals, which would be on a huge screen behind a famous artist playing at huge, concerts and festivals um th this was you know when we actually saw it happening as well after we had completed it this was something we could just quite comprehend when we first mm -hmm. saw it so when the opportunity came knocking when when a man called jordan miles rosenheck sent an email asking to see if we wanted to collaborate obviously we we're not going to say no so we jumped at the opportunity and we've had one of the most um artistically and creatively satisfactory relationships and experience working on this project, culminating in some of the best work we've ever done and some, some of the most challenging work we've ever done because we were forced to think outside the box in so many ways, do things that while you know, technically may not have been the most uh, on, on some of them, some of them were really pushing the envelope, but on, on some of them not the most technically demanding things, the challenge of taking 
all the assets, putting them into After Effects, and then coordinating everything to the lights, to the music, to the sounds. The choreography part was actually more challenging than I thought it would be. Um, you really have to kind of immerse yourself in the music at first, and just kind of feel the, the energy of it, and, and then just start experimenting with lights, putting them on, and I've seen what works, seen what doesn't, getting into the flow of it, and, and then something will click and you'll be on your way. But it definitely, at first I thought, oh, this is gonna be super easy. You just jump into After Effects, you just start. You look at the beat, you look at the, uh, you look at the waveform, and you're like, I'll put on the lights there, every single beat. It's, it's not so simple, it's, it's not as, as easy as that. You really have to um, come up with something creative when you do it. Um, there are plugins which can do so much for you, but they'll never get down to that granular level, which is where we had to rely purely on um, intuition. Right, so I'm going to tell you now about the old gods. I don't have any favorites, and if you were to ask me what my favorite child is, I would never be able to say it's this one, but it is this one um, so far. This started as a very, very, very small scale um, incubation idea project in during the holiday period of 2021 to 2022 where I just took two weeks and decided to design six gods, six mythical gods, uh, based on a, an idea I had about three years ago to do something in the similar vein to this. So the, the concept marinated for a while until the, the, you know, the studio was in a place where we had enough talent, enough people, enough time, enough finance to be able to, to dedicate to this. So the first thing that we wanted to do was find what the hell this could be. What is what is the potential of this? What happened is it became a super fun and kind of creative project where all these things worked in unison with each other. This is the project that led to everything else that we've discussed in this talk. So I'd like to finish this by letting you guys see the actual film that we ended up making for this. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. Thank you very much.
Yes. Uh... <laughs> Epic. I have no other word. Zero. Ah, uh, shucks. Yeah. Amazing. Thanks. <laughs> Great guys. I mean, so much. This is what I meant by unique and different and absolutely, yep. yeah, out of the box. Um, how do you guys? I mean, obviously, you started. You were both architectural vis people and then you started you started the studio Lewis and then you started to get all these different clients and projects and probably it's kind of the same thing as Andrea said you don't need to work with people you don't want to work with but how does people how do people come to you and attract you and you get you know all these beautiful things to work with? how did Jordan come for instance well funny enough Jordan came because of the old gods so, um, I mean, to answer your question, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a chicken and egg situation, right? So you don't have clients if you don't have work, but you need to have a great team to be able to produce amazing work. You need to have a team that aligns with sort of the mindset that you initially have, I guess, to kind of honor the things that you started to, to, to that you set up a studio for. And um, I've, I've been doing this for a very long time. I've been doing this for 15 years. And it, it, it was at a point where I reached everything I could in my, in my professional life. I became a director of a very well-known company and I was there for a long time. And I was just ready for a new challenge. So to answer your sort of question there, I guess it is the pursuit for more to kind of touch on what Andrea said earlier. It's like your next image is your best one. Um, the the kind of un, undisclosed narrative motto, I guess, is we're 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 capable of more, as professionals, as artists, as creatives. So, I guess the timing was absolutely perfect. You know what I mean? Like th there is an element of being good in business. There is an element of being a good professional, and there's an element of luck involved in in all of this. And I guess the stars aligned in in in, in a way. Um, twenty twenty two, like we kind of said in the in the um, in the talk there, was a year that we sort of really heavily invested into our incubation R and D, developing our own sort of IP, which was one of the things that we set up the studio to do from the very beginning. Not just do client work, but also have our own properties. Um, and these results of that led to all this new stream of work that is frankly something that's absolutely mind-blowing like um, we cut a lot of the like the, the gushing that we felt uh being invited and and kind of like having really sort of people outside the traditional work that we tend to do look at us and consider us as a studio um offering us an opportunity to kind of work and also giving us creative freedom this is this is the amazing mind-blowing thing that whatever project we get to work on now it's pretty much do what you want to do this these are the constraints go absolutely crazy there's not much interference and it is a very sort of pure and holistic experience at that so it's i mean it, it's a little bit of a wild ride this is why we call this talk entering the unknown because for us it's kind of a little bit on that realm part one because hopefully it's not going to be the last one like this that we do yeah i yeah 
complete answer. Thank you. <laughs> We've got a question. Andrea. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, well, I, I finished all my congratulations and uh, all the positive feedback. I already said everything. So, I, so the question is, um, what's the perfect team to meet this request? Like to make this, uh, sorry, uh, what are the features of your perfect team to that, that is able to work on like a more um, standard project in a way and then jump on, jump on this crazy project and then do the, the old gods project and then do the real estate one? Like, like uh, what, what are you yeah. working with? Like, I guess or, to, be, uh, to be complete or, weirdos. <laughs> Very much. I, I think this is a two-part sort or, of answer. But uh, I think also, I, I, like, what is the background of, also of these people? That's it. So the, the difficulty we have is we headhunt people. It needs to be very, very, very specific types of people that are able to, to I guess, um, navigate these, these, these sort of uh, uh, weird waters. Um, in my case, for example, I'm a graphic designer originally. I started doing VFX and um, and then started working on commercials and then did illustration and then somehow ended falling into architectural visualization because I love architecture as well. Um, and then made a career out of that, uh, cut my teeth into that for a very long time. And then in a weird way, decided to kind of revisit my origin and my and, and honor sort of the roots in the beginning of, of, of this, this whole process you know when we're children we have all these outside sort of influences and stimuli and and things that we're exposed to and and you know we, we're either very artistic for example i was an absolutely terrible student um but i was very good at drawing so i kind of followed that through line again and started to that's why narrative is so heavily design based and branded based so the, I guess the next step after establishing uh, the ambition of what, what this could be, it's finding the absolutely insane individuals, like Robin said, the weirdos, um, to be able to carry that. So you, 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 I, I had to find initially people who were very different to me to, to, ver to basically patch all the holes that I have as a professional, but also very similar in the, in the case of being slightly insane and slightly fearless, right? And maybe ignorant in some ways, but also ignorance leads to, to, to not, nothing is impossible. Maybe Robin can add something to that answer. <laughs> maybe. No, I mean, sorry. sorry, sorry. I <laughs> Are you here, Robin? <laughs> About time. I had some, some background noise. Yeah, I mean, I mean, one of the main things is just about being kind of open um, and wanting to learn more, wanting to kind of expand, wanting to explore, because, you know, like for me, my foundation to an architecture and there um, and then that went on to ArcVis. But I feel like, you know, this isn't necessarily us leaving ArcVis, um, but I feel like every time you try and experiment, you try new things, you always learn something new, which then you can take back into what you like. You can take that back into ArcVis, for example. Um, but otherwise, you just end up kind of plateauing, I think. Um, if you just carry on doing the same thing, you, you get to a certain level where you, you kind of just need to break the mold. You need to kind of shock the system and do something different. And that's what we love to do all the time, um, particularly because we're a fairly kind of small studio, so we're quite mobile. You know, we have the opportunity to say, right, let's, let's not just take on these projects because we want to try and get loads of money. Um, instead, let's try something completely crazy and, and, you know, see what comes from it. And that's kind of our, particularly this year, we've gone completely wild and just done bonkers stuff. And like, like Luis was saying, it started off with doing the gods thing as something quite personal to us. And then other people saw it. And then we got new, we got new clients, which we just never, we, we never even thought we were going to get. We didn't actually, we, we put the whole project on Behance and we didn't really think anything of it. And then we got Griffin. And then we were like, okay, so this does lead to somewhere. But yeah. 
and there's there's other interesting stuff in the pipeline as well so we haven't necessarily uh, abandoned this ship and whatever we've learned in these arenas we're bringing into the sort of the mainline projects as well so trying to push out even more the restrictions and the perceived sort of uh, status quo of, of what is doable and possible and 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 the established ways of doing things yeah I see a lot of questions about um, mid journey, and obviously there was a bit of uh, like a, a bit in your presentation of how you're yeah. recreating something that you've done in mid journey. And obviously, we haven't discussed anything about this madness. Um, but I'll use the time now to ask: How does that affect your workflow? It's actually a um, question from the audience. How does that affect your workflow? And is there any change from your normal work? workflow with now this AI developed more and more? Yeah, that, that, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, yeah, we, we saw, I mean, pretty much every day you go on LinkedIn now or any other social media, you, you see people using mid journey everywhere. And, um, <clears throat> but we kind of felt like, you know, we saw this great stuff. We were like, but we were kind of like, well, you know, now what? Um, so the stuff you saw on the show reel was not, that wasn't, a, that wasn't a commercial thing. That was kind of a personal thing where um, we thought, how let's just try and go through the process and see what happens if we generate something with Mid Journey, and then we um, make a three D image from that. And it, it was more to actually see not just how can we use it in the commercial world, but what can we actually learn from it? Because you know, with Mid Journey, it, it makes very kind of nice surreal images where your brain kind of makes up the rest of the detail for you. And often in three D, we kind of get a little bit too obsessed with the details. So we're zooming in on stuff and we, we get we get lost and we're like, okay, let's spend 10 hours on, you know, a table in the background. And in reality, that doesn't really matter in the, when you look at the whole picture, it's, it's more about, it is more about the whole picture. So for me personally, it was, you know, what can I, I was kind of learning something from AI, you know, what makes these images so special? Um, but then, yeah, going back to how can we use it commercially? I think it's, it's going to be very, very useful for, initial concept stages because that's the part which it, it, it can do very well it can really kind of make very nice immersive images which can capture our imagination and the client's imagination because you know like, like i was saying because it is very kind of surreal so your brain kind of fills in all the blanks for you um so it's, it, it, it is definitely something we're going to use in the future and i'm sure other studios are going to use it as well i've been speaking to quite a few people and they're saying you know we're using it for the same kind of reasons um but yeah the, the, that that one you saw there that was let's take this to the next step let's let's not just make an image with it let's actually make something with it and then make something even more real with it 3d i suppose and, and what one of the amazing things about ai in general is that we've been using ai quite a bit in our actual day-to-day -day production work for a long time now from face app to just you know using um yeah solvers and uh, and uh, image solvers i guess to, to kind of test how how low set quality setting we can render and then bring it back to also um just doubling the size of a, of a film to kind of um specifically enhance people uh without having to kind of go back to the drawing board people is a very 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 broad topic of conversation and so many people have so many passionate opinions about using people and images and things it's like it has to be 2d or it has to be 3d we find that it's some something slightly in the middle right you have the, the capabilities to do both why don't you embrace a hybrid approach to how you deal with people use them as the best tool sometimes 2d is better Sometimes it's 3D and then you enhance with 2D manually, or sometimes you just use face app and then just absolutely fucking great, yeah, get, get, get an amazing face. We're, like we, we, we use AI <laughs> if it's going to save us time, for sure. I mean, we'll do that. I'm not going to sit there for ages on Photoshop and, and Photoshop a real person's face onto a 3D person's face. I'm going to use face app. It's, it takes two seconds. <laughs> yeah, bending all the rules. I like that. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> for sure. That's cool, yeah. I actually have a question for more of all of you guys. So not just uh, Robin and Lewis, but also like the rest of you guys. Um, and we haven't heard so much from John for a while. So I think we'll start with him. Um, <laughs> so in terms of times keep moving forward, we're all, get a little, we're all getting a little bit older, uh, apparently, except for Joanna for some reason. 
Um, <laughs> but we, how do you, what do you do to keep up with the times in terms of um, software development and new techniques and new stuff coming around now? Mid journey was, was the theme right before, but also just sometimes, you know, new version of this and that 3D program and new features and like, there's so much going on all the time. So how do you keep up with, with the demand basically? Yeah. So I tend to obviously experiment and play around with these, like, you know, when mid journey comes in, I see how I can bring it into my pipe flow. Um, I don't personally actively go looking for the latest software to test it. Um, I will end up having a problem within like a, a current project and be like, oh, okay, what is available to help me, you know, overcome this problem? Because I, I, I don't know, I'm very much in my downtime. I like to kind of travel as opposed to like look at what's out there um, <clears throat> and I'll wait until the issue comes around and then I'll try and attack it and see, you know, it's more, it's one of those things that you do your research when you need to do your research. Um, I, I love the people who get like straight on the bandwagon. They're like, oh, something else, something news out. I'm going to learn it. And maybe I'm just a little bit lazy. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I love seeing when people do like run with a brand new thing that's come out and they, they smash it. That's awesome. Then it inspires me to be like, oh, maybe I should go back into that software and, you know, play around again. Um, but yeah, it's always like per project sort of, um, when I, when I have to dig deep. All right, so not a, not as much a first mover in terms of of technology. You're more getting inspired by when someone else posts something that oh, I I started using this or I tried out something like this, and then you get inspired and go into it like that. That's pretty clever. Does any other of you guys have any inputs on how do you keep up with like time? Because I I personally struggle with it a lot. Like you have an everyday job and you, you keep working and working and working and then you get off and obviously you need to like relax. There's no time to, you know, I can't find always the energy to start to keep up with new technology and, and everything all the time. So I'm wondering what are you doing? I think um, for me personally, um, I guess when I was younger, when you saw a new piece of software, it was more this looks super exciting. I'm going to learn it, but you didn't really know why you were going to learn it. It just looks so cool. You know, maybe you saw, um, you saw a show reel or something and you were like, this is, this just looks super awesome. You don't even think anymore. You just go and learn it. But I think now it's more, um, because I guess as you evolve as an artist or for me personally, it was as I evolved, I guess I, I, I wanted to focus more on the artistic side. Do you kind of really, you get to a point where you realize that the, the, the tech is, it's just a tool, obviously. Um, so for me now, when I see new stuff, I think it's more, how is this going to help me? Is this going to kind of speed up my workflow? Is it going to, um, you know, cut my time? Um, and it's more focused on that rather than, is this just kind of another cool thing to learn, I guess? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I can kind of second um, a little bit on what Robin's saying. It's like, for example, I have a, a very personal policy of I do absolutely no personal work whatsoever. Every single, I, I'm a commercial artist through and through, and every single thing I do has to come through commercial means. Um, and it's a decision I made a long time ago. But in my private time, um, it's all about reinforcing fundamentals and working on my mind's eye and working on, um, aside from getting better in uh, in, in day to day things, um, like Max and all these sort of things by by doing naturally. Also, you need to be complete as a person. Right. So you need to grow as a person, you need to develop as a person, work on yourself physically, work on yourself mentally, read more, travel. Like Johnny said, that's that's incredibly fundamental. That's how you find inspiration. And even though you the mechanical aspect of it, the fundamentals will always be 100 percent the same unless we get to, you know, the the the, um, I, the, the, the word uh, escapes me right now. The uh, fourth dimension. Yeah, exactly. What, what we become one of the machines if it does happen at all. But at the end of the day, you keep developing your mind's eye and you keep training all the time. You are, we, we are visual people and we find creativity everywhere. At least that's, that's for me the case. I find creativity in music and going out and walking in, you know, outside. Someone says something or I see a really, really awful uh, graphic design on a, on, a, on a shop. And then that reminds me of a film. And then you create all these neural connections in your mind 
that is what brings inspiration and that is what then triggers or i guess fuels the need to to take a new bit of software and kind of go right what is similar to what came before what is different and what is the point of me actually learning this because if you just want to jump on every new bandwagon you're going to die tired true yeah, it's, it it's going now. yeah so what i'm saying it's kind of brief driven like you get a brief or you have a thought uh, that you want to solve this particular problem and then you start researching exactly what the best way of solving that problem is rather than just knowing everything because nobody knows everything yeah true so you're more of a yeah a technical approach to to your to your problem basically instead of just yeah. ex explorative approach i guess which some might you know use a lot more i have uh, a number of time vampires in my life that I need to <laughs> yeah that, yeah well, since require other responsibilities you know you I teach understand. so I kind of feel like I need to promote the idea of internships hmm? so actually having paid interns and I cannot stress enough how much it should be paid interns but getting paid interns into your companies might actually be a good way for you to get new knowledge into your company about new tech that you've never had the ability or time to to go into or anything like that. Um, so that's just me, obviously trying to promote the idea of of what education can do for for companies and why they should get something like interns and invest in their own company and by getting apprenticeships, interns, and all of these great things. Um, and this really, um links yeah. back to what Andrea was saying at the end as well that he figured out that um, his best way to grow is be surrounded by the right people. And you can get that through interns. They don't have to be like seniors every time. They just have to add a certain different aspect to the way you do your work. You, you know, if you're focused on the technical and then you have someone who just throws in these creative ideas and you can bounce that off each other, it can force both of you to grow in that way. It doesn't have to be learning new software. It's more, as um, Lewis was saying as well, expanding your personal at the same time. It's just as important as you know, picking up Houdini. Yeah, and also learning from each other as well is quite important. For me, probably that's the thing. Like, I communicate with a lot of people, and my source is always people. Um, but, you know, you bounce ideas, you get to know how did they make that, how what's new that they've used. So it's kind of very, very good, very amazing thing to have and be in a community to share ideas and, you know, keep the knowledge, bounce the knowledge, and pass the knowledge on, which is quite important. It goes back to your Nicholas point education as well so yeah let's see if we have any huh, cool. questions from the audience um we have a question from narrative of how large the team is obviously and uh people want to have jobs to do well we are four in london one in vancouver um and yeah absolutely i mean the the the, the thing that you need to kind of uh no in advance is be a weirdo have your own voice and make sure you 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 damn make it clear through an email rather than just sending something that is very generic and you know something that doesn't look like the work that we do i guess is is kind of the best way like we we're all we are always on the lookout and we put a job advert a long time ago and yeah we, we've, we've been in conversations with fantastic people um but it's very hard it's very hard to find people who fit in into the specific niche of creative that we need so always open to conversations for sure i'm sure people are very pleased to hear that and if you're nearby just pop into the office andrea wants to fly <laughs> just come and see us that's done. Don't worry about it. Don't send your portfolio. It's, it's fine. <laughs> Very good. Did you want? Did you have a question? Are you actually? You know, You're waving, or did you have a question? <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, I would have lying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just volunteering. <laughs> All right, so we're almost at the end of this show. And before I forget, I actually wanted to pitch in or at least promote the idea for speaking of students and internships, apprenticeships, all of that. 
uh, Chaos is actually doing a uh, student rendering challenge. So don't forget to actually go and check that out as well. Um, there's a lot of uh, great people in the jury, myself, for example, Nikos Nikolopoulos, Sonia Christoph, a lot of uh, people you've probably seen from also last year's show. Um, so be sure to check that out if you're a student and you want to get the chance to win some great prizes. Yeah, the deadline is November 23rd, as you can see on the main screen right now. So it's great. Yay. Remember to do that. <laughs> Sweet, and I think it's time to, because there were some games throughout the short one, and there were some winners as well. So maybe it's time to announce some of the winners. Let's see, who do we have? So for social media giveaway winner, we have Todor Lichev, who posted in for a Facebook event, in a Facebook event. So congratulations to Todor. Um, and as I can see, we have another winner for the raffle, who is, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce the name correct, uh, Gan Gi from Vietnam. So congratulations from you, Gan. Um, these are the winners. So I just wanted to make sure we mentioned them because who, everyone loves to win. So yeah, well done, guys. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. Um, yeah. We have two minutes until the end of this page. <gasps> How does everyone feel? Yeah, good. Yeah, good. <laughs> All good. <laughs> 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 that wasn't planned. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a mutual feeling. That's good. Oh. No, yeah. good inspired. Really yes. beautiful work, really inspiring people, really iconic and memorable work for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I actually want to ask if is there any specific region any of you guys are looking more more forward to uh, in the 24 hours uh, to come? Like are there any countries or regions that you yeah. want to uh to check out? I'm uh, all in for the Aussies for Australia and nice. uh, also for the next one for the Brazilian guys that uh, will coming next because they will yeah. have amazing guys from character animation a lot of things coming up. But uh, as an artist guy, I'm watching a lot of people in Singapore, Asia, and uh, also in Australia. So I'm really looking forward. Hopefully I can be awake because those guys are so far ahead from Portugal. But uh, yeah, let's see how, how it really goes. But uh, if we are not able to watch it live, we can also watch the recorded sessions that will be available later to, this, uh, this year. Yeah. Right. Well, I think we're off time, so maybe let's wait for show number two. And well done, guys. You're all amazing. Thank you so yeah, much man. for being with Thank us. You. We have a great show. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.